On this episode, I reintroduce you to one of the Sukis from episode 58, Old Dirty Boosie and the Suki Sukis. My guest is Trey, or AKA Ernest III, but I go by Trey. One of his most distinctive qualities is his remarkable ability to maintain a broad perspective in various situations, showcasing his immersed empathy. This was evident during his time as a walk-on at UT, navigating landscape where some people had scholarships and other walk-ons had financial support that he did not. His motto, just wear it, which adds to the respect for the man that he is. We also talk about the best way to raise money for cancer is by fighting a bear on pay-per-view. Let's jump in. Everybody. Welcome to the Molly Good Podcast. Uh, thank you for coming back. I appreciate it so much. Uh, as always, before we get started with uh, my uh, return guests, uh, what I'm touting as always remix. <laughs> remix uh <laughs> let me do my regular shout outs joe andrade media he's the one that makes me look cool on the internet uh my guy jason he has a wish pocket he does all my sound that's why we're gonna sound so good tonight uh my guy jaron he has no names originals support local north carolina artists doing his thing i have his artwork he bleaches clothes he does cool shit go check it out this is all on instagram by the way and probably facebook but mostly instagram uh uh, check out my guy Mo. He has the Go Bubble app, and if you put in the promo code Go Moderately, you get a discount. My guy Peyton has Lone Sun Decor. You you know you know this guy, yes, right? You Lone like, Sun S U N. Yeah, S U N, and it's cool shit. He does really cool shit. I think he does. Yes, and we did a shirt together, which was cool. Saw yeah. that recently. Yeah, very cool. Got the collab. Yeah, yeah. I, awesome. Right, and then uh, last last but not least, my guy uh, David A A K Cupcake um, that provides uh, food and beverage for the podcast. You can find him at Shiner Saloon down on Fifth and Congress. I think that is, um, and they do like live music and they have like all kinds of beers and whiskeys and all that cool shit. If you're into that, um, but thank you, David, for uh, donating and stuff. And if you're watching on on YouTube, please subscribe, Spotify, follow, Apple, follow. As I said, this is a remix. And um, so your real government full name is what? Legally, uh, if you were to be asking like uh, an officer of the court. That's yeah, right. I am Ernest William Gonzalez the third. But you've only up to this point been introduced to me as Trey, and because that's because I'm, the, because the, I'm the a third. third. I have to explain that in like way more detail than I care to to so many people because they're like, I don't. You're, where do you get Trey from? It's just come a third. So I have a cousin that's a Trey. That's a third. What's his real name? Uh, uh, his real name is oh shit. Now I'm going blank. Oh, I'm my family's gonna kill me. Oh, I just know him as Trey. We like, may have I, to I, cut like, this part no, out. No, no, I just know him. I just know him as Trey. I just, but like, but uh, he he has a name Trey because he's a third. Because he's a third. Yeah, yeah. I've met Burl. Bur oh no, I know it's Burl Gassner the third. Burl Gassner the third. <laughs> I don't know. I, I had a total mind fart on that. BG three. Yeah, BG. Oh. That's an easy one. Oh man, but I mean, but they we know him as Trey. Now yeah. I'm not only thinking him as BG three. Now he's gonna be Trey, aka BG three, aka Burl Gassner the third. That's right. Um, no, in in my life, I've met. One tray. No, no, I take that back. Two. One in college and one in my professional life. People that were named Trey, that that was their like legal name that's on their driver's license. All the other trays that I've ever met have been nicknames. For thirds? For thirds. Really? I've also known a Trace, T R E S. Uh, he was a third. Trip. But was he Hispanic? He was. Okay, fair. Uh, Trip, T R I P P. And that means third? Third. Uh, Trace, T-R-A-C-E, real name Heston. He was a third guy I went to high school with. I So I think about this sometimes because, so my daughter's name is Lucille June Gassner, but we call her Lucy. Sure. 
And more specifically, we call her Lucy June. Okay. And more specifically, she tells us to n- only call her Lucy. All right. But like, I always think about like when I say Lucille, like she does, she's like, I, I who's Lucille? I don't who's know who's that person. Yeah, who's that person? Because we've always called her Lucy. And I was like, did we do her a disservice? Because now she's going to go around going, my real name is Ernest. What did you say? What's well, your- she's not going to say that because no, no, that's I'm, not her name. No, but I'm saying like, you know, she's going to go around with her own like, like I'm not Lucy. I'm I'm so, Lucy, you know. So just to get you ready, I know you said she's about to be three, so she'll be starting school in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, when she starts school, they're going to say uh, Lucille, and she's going to say I go by Lucy, and she's going to have to deal with that on the first day of school, and then anytime she has a sub. Because they're gonna get the list. I feel so fucking irresponsible right now. No, you're you're good. It builds character. It's <laughs> uh, it's a crucial component of growing up with like a a more stately name. There is that like okay. So what do you identify? Because your dad had the same name. He was Ernest William Gonzalez Jr. Okay, right. Oh, well, yeah, that's what I meant. So he just went by Ernest. Okay, so but. Do you at this? Do you? How do you identify like yourself when you think of yourself? Do you think of yourself as Trey, or do you kind of think of yourself like as the third of your dad? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that that definitely makes sense. And it's funny because when I was younger, I would always be introduced as "This is Ernest the Third. We call him Trey." That was always like you had to say the whole thing. It's like a tribe called Quest. You got to say all of it. That 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 is that is one hundred percent your rap name. Yeah. This is this is like would you say Ernest the Third? We call him Trey. Ernest the Third, we call him Trey. Yeah, yeah, that, that's you got, the rap. You gotta name. say the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like that Mexican OT. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I I think of myself as Trey. Like that's how I introduce myself. But if people call me Ernest, it doesn't bother me because it's my name. So when I when I was when I was younger, when I was going through school and having the subs, you know, come in and Ernest, you'd always hear that. Oh, ha, 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 we're gonna call you Ernest. And I was always, like, it used to bother me when I was younger. But it got to a point where I was like, you know, fuck it. You can call me that. That's my name. I don't care. And once I started being like, oh, yeah, I don't care, they, you know, people would forget. Do you remember the guy, Ernest, that had the movies? Yeah. I, I heard a lot of those. Did that fuck you? Did that fuck your shit up? It, uh, it didn't help. It, no. Because people were like, oh, what would you do this summer? Did, did you go to camp? Did you go to jail? <laughs> did you save Christmas? And I was like, okay, fuck you. Kid, kids are jerks. Kids are the worst. Like, like I got made fun of because my last name is Gassner. Okay. So they would say, like, How ga- do you make fun of that? Gas ass. Oh, that's. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's, Scott, that's oh, my ha- first name is Scott, so they go Scotty Potty. That's hack writing. But, but that's, these, but like these are like third, but, these are like third graders. But when you're a kid, that's like devastating. What? what yeah. Oh yeah. You're I like, mean, I'm I was, never gonna come back from this. I was like, I'm changing my we name. We need to move. I'm changing. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's no way I can't go back to school. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, it, it's so funny. Little things like that. That thinking back, you're like, that's so dumb. But at the time, you're like, this has altered my worldview, and this is the beginning of my villain arc. When people look back and they're like, man, how did how did Scott? you know, go so wrong and walk down such a dark path. You're like, they called him Scotty potty. Yeah. And, and then, he never forgave. He them. never recovered. And that's, he started plotting his revenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see those stats on like, we asked a hundred people, you know, what animal they thought they could beat in a fight. And there's always at least like two, three jackasses that think that they could take on like a grizzly bear or a lion or a polar bear or even like a hippo or something, and they're like, "Oh no, I could, I could take one." Okay, so let's say that you, okay, what animal do you think you could take out? The biggest animal you could take down successfully, one on one. That there's there's a lot of qualifiers for these. Is it just am I like dropped into a room with this animal? You have no weapons. No weapons. Okay, that's a big one. Okay, you're you're in a room with this animal. Um, it's pretty, it's a fairly size, good size space, but like, it's just like plain walls or something to grab nothing. It's just you. It's like you're in the octagon, but it's like solid. Yeah. Um, bigger than an octagon though, man. Do you think you could take out a small monkey? Uh, a, a small one. Really? You gotta be, you gotta be careful with monkeys though, because they got like baboons have sharp teeth. Baboons will fuck you up. Well, and I feel like they just go and they'll just poke your eyes out. Yeah, like immediately, right? 
It's it's wild too because you read about like you know the mountain men that you know they stuck their arm down the throat of a mountain lion or something and killed it like one on one in like an extreme situation. But as far as like if I got to just pick, um, I'm gonna play it pretty conservative and say I could like I'm definitely gonna be okay against like a malinois or like a german shepherd (laughs) i mean but you don't think you don't think that dog could bleed you out it totally could that's why i said a dog and not a wolf okay so did you ever what was that movie with leonardo caprio where he, he fucking fought that bear the revenant okay what did he have for weapons i don't know i've never seen it i'm just I, aware of it I, 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 i've seen parts of okay so so he beat that bear yeah Okay, <laughs> I'm trying to come over this. I'm, I'm, there's I, a, so I have I, a bigger question that I'm trying to get to. So, okay, so I'm going to put you in his scenario. Okay. Okay, so now, unfortunately, you have some like some sort of terminal cancer. Okay. Okay, and we can raise money for cancer by you fighting this bear. Would you do it? Uh I mean, if it's going to help other people, I would yeah. do it. Well, like they've already established your, your terminal, like you're going to die, I'm gonna die anyway. anyway, but you're still at full health right now. Ugh. Like you haven't gotten, you haven't whittled down yet to like nothing. What kind of bear? Whatever he fought. <laughs> it was definitely a grizzly. It was definitely a big ass bear. So there's. It was cocaine bear. The reason I ask is because like a black bear, you'd have much better odds against because they're traditionally a lot smaller. Okay. So I think if I had, but would you fight a bear for cancer? Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> would you? Uh, yeah, if I'm gonna die anyway, I guess. I mean, I think that I'm still gonna like you're, you're gonna die either way. Let, let me be clear. I'm not saying I'm gonna beat this bear for cancer. I'll fight it for cancer. But, but can you imagine if you did like a pay per view where you fight a bear, man fights bear, right, and all the money goes to cancer. Yeah, I'd do it. Yeah, I'd do it. Yeah, sure. Fuck yeah. Fighting bears for cancer. Wanna... I'm gonna start a whole website, fighting bears for cancer. <laughs> yeah, fighting bears for cancer dot gov. Uh like yeah, I don't if they told me for sure, like, hey, you're gonna die, you don't wanna die that death. That's not a good one. So just go out fighting a bear. Yeah. You know. Well, I, I... If I don't have terminal cancer and they just say, hey, you have to pick like a wild predatory animal to fight. You're going with a you, you German, have to like a, the would you, what dog mallet would you say like a like a Malinois or like a German shepherd or like police dogs. Mm. I think I think, I, could, I think you're going to have to go more like 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 smaller <laughs> like you, a german shepherd i'm in a room with a border collie and i'm just you know or a mini aussie and i'm just taking them out fucking just like it's like one of those like small poodles you're just like, <laughs> so yeah uh it's a what is it a, a multi poo i'm oh, smashing that thing i'm not i'm not a fan of poodles at all uh golden like the doodles yeah. weird me out they look like people in dog costumes I never thought of it that way, but my brother it's, has like a doodle dog. It's kind of weird, man. And like now when I think about it, when you come to the door, he like jump, he like just puts his paws on you. Yeah. And it's like he's a person in a costume going like, hey, why are you in my house? Hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Do you have, you have a pass? Yeah. You have any treats? Um, How do you get in here? No, about the only violence I get into with animals is uh, sometimes I'll like judo flip my dog over when we're playing around. But he likes that. Yeah. She's all about it. Yeah. Um, I, w- I wouldn't want to, but all, all, all dogs matter. All dogs matter. Yeah. Even the little shit eating ones, even poodles, even poodles, I guess they're fine. If you had to make the choice between like watermelon and Oreos, you know, watermelon's the win, right? It is. Cause the serving size on Oreos is dog shit. It's like two cookies. Who's eating two Oreos? Dude, I, I'll. So I do, I'm an Oreo fanatic. Okay. And I'll do the, uh, the thins. Ooh, yeah. But I'll eat a, I'll eat a sleeve. I'll eat a side. So, so really what am I, what am I doing? What am I saving? Are you a Costco guy? Uh, yes. I'd have to look up the brand name, but have you seen the brownie brittle Mm -hmm. square? Oh man, those are good. We got, they had the industrial size bags of them and they were buy one, get one. And so we bought them right before that uh, 
we went to the lake for Fourth of July. We went to Canyon Lake with some friends, and so we took one, and then we had one at home. And of course, it only got like half eight at the lake, so we've been slowly working on them over time. And uh, man, it didn't melt out there. Uh, well, they're like they're like Oreo thins. Oh, okay. Because the ones I saw were like uh, they're like just kind of flat, like clusters of like chocolate. And then they would have them like over some sort of like uh, not a pretzel, but something like that. Mm, okay. uh, like like a, more like a bark. Are you talking about the JoJo's bites? Maybe. What are those? Those are, that's another thing they have at Costco that my girlfriend is just absolutely bonkers for. I'm about to talk to Erin and she, she's the one that kind of does all the shopping. Okay. I feel like she's not searching every part of Costco. She, you're definitely. If, if we're missing out on these, she's, these snacks. She's hosing you, man. She's sandbagging you with the Costco trip. Uh, but no, these are more almost kind of like a cracker, but it's just like a little square. Oh, it's called brownie brittle. That sounds dangerous. And uh, it's like if somebody just cut all the edge pieces out of a brownie pan. Ooh, but I would uh, be in for that. But they're real thin. And then when they get crushed up, you don't have to throw them out. You just put them over ice cream and shit. Oh, man. Dude, this is what I'm into right now. This is what I started doing. This just sounds like like a crackhead. I started just dump dumping M and M's into our peanut jar, peanut butter jar. Okay, and just spooning out all the M and M's with peanut butter. That's pretty. <laughs> that's pretty fat. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like, well, like, what the? What's wrong with me? Back when we were playing ball, like you'd see somebody doing something at dining hall or eating something, and you would just go fat. And like okay, that was well, it. Well, okay. So, what do you remember? Some of the contrap, like the what people would put together, or you would see somebody's plate. Oh, you go, man. oh, you go, what is that? And you're like, hey, man, I put this and this together. So I don't remember any particularly like wild combos, but when you were like first got there and you're trying to gain weight, you'd see people doing some pretty wild shit, like you know, big bowls of peanut butter with just like honey granola chocolate chips uh man and then guys with just like pasta you could go to the pasta bar and they would just fuck you up at the pasta bar so you'd be like let me get some of this and uh throw some of those in there and so you get people that are like you know chicky chicky tendies and uh chalky milk and then you go to the pasta bar and you come back with something and they're like what is all of that i don't even know what that is and you're like don't worry about it that's capers you don't even know what capers are you're like nobody's eating them, so I just thought I would eat them. Yeah, and it was it was funny going through as a non picky eater because the people that worked at dining hall would get super charged up about it, and they're like, "Ooh, I, yeah." I, uh, so we got this other stuff, and I'm gonna make you one of these, and you would just be like, "Cool, just do it to me." So it, that was always funny. Have you ever eaten at a uh, like a buffet in uh, Vegas? Yes. Okay. How does uh, like do y'all did y'all have a special dining hall to put when y'all? We did. Uh, that's a complicated answer, though. Okay. Which we can get into. Are we we're recording right now? We are recording okay. right now. Okay, gotcha. Oh, yeah. I guess I was supposed to do like, hey, do you know we're recording? Yes. You acknowledge that you know we're recording? Now I do. Okay. So none of that counts? <laughs> no, we got to throw all that out. All right. Say, and then say your full name. Uh, my name is Trey Gonzalez. All right. Awesome. Yes. Now we're official. Now we're official. Now we're legit. I'm totally going to leave that in, by the way. <laughs> Ridiculous. Anyways, go ahead. So... Yeah, uh, I was asking you, I was basically, my question was going to be, how does UT, the dining hall that y'all would dine in compare to a Vegas buffet? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say it's the selection is comparable. Uh, we definitely, it was like food as fuel, you know, you're eating to fuel your body kind of deal. So they're just like laying just, chicken breasts out there. And yeah. Stuff. So a lot less, um, a lot less of the the super decadent type stuff. Um, it was more, you know, healthy things. They would have some of the options that were a little worse, uh, worse for you, but they did like a little flag system. So if it had a green um, little placard in front of it, it meant eat as much as you want. And then if it had a yellow placard, it was, you know, hey, you can have this, but not too much. And if it had a red one, it was like, hey, this is not good for you. You shouldn't be eating mostly this red stuff. Who, who was listening to these placards? No one. No, no one. one was. It was just there for educational purposes. <laughs> but you get some guys that, you know, the only thing they trust is pizza 
or something like that, which is red, but that's all they eat. They'd go to dining hall and eat half a pizza at lunch and you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't touch any of the vegetables or anything like that. So you, you were, you're a big eater or were a big eater, right? When you played and all that yes, stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, was there people that were bigger eaters than you? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, I do you remember a big eater and like what he ate, like in one ooh. setting. It would definitely be the O-line guys, and I couldn't pick out any, like, one of them. Um, what would be a meal? Like, what would you say if, if you're going to pick out, like, the, an O-line meal? What would all be on there? Um, there's definitely going to be some pasta. Pizza? So probably, like, a plate of pasta, maybe one or two pieces of pizza. You'd see a hot dog, like, sticking out of the side in a bun, like, but it was just piled on the plate. And then some of those guys would go like two, three chicken breasts and, um, you know, then like a bowl of ice cream for dessert or something like that. So they had, do they have any green placard dessert? Uh, fruit, fruit and like cottage cheese or like, I think peanut butter was a yellow item because, you know, peanut butter has a lot of fat in it. So it just depended. Um, that was actually later. The reason I said that was a complicated answer about us having our own dining hall is that there was a separate athletics dining hall. Due to some of the NCAA regulations as walk-ons, we were not allowed in there all the time. And that may have just been a UT thing. Cause I've heard from people at other places that if you were on the team, you got access to the team stuff. Um, but when I first came on, like under Mac Brown staff once a month, I think we would have like an occasional meal. It, it was specifically called that an occasional meal. And so they'd be like, all right, dinner is for everybody tonight. You know, we're up in the touchdown club or where, wherever. Um, and then, under I think under Strong's staff we were allowed dinner every night and then you could add lunch but you had to pay for it so it was like whatever it was like 350 400 bucks for the semester you had like a lunch pass to the athletics dining hall which was arguably better than a regular one how much better though uh I don't know if it was enough better to justify the cost but it was in the north end zone, they built a new one right. up there. So it was in the north end zone. Uh, so that was nicer because it was close. And then it wasn't as crowded because it was only athletes and like staff that mm -hmm. was going in there. Um, so you didn't have to wade through, you know, a bunch of warm bodies to get up to the buffet line. So that part was cool. Did, this is a weird question. Did like... Did like all the uh, scholarship players kind of sit at one table and the walk-ons would sit at another table together, uh, like like high school kind of? Yeah, yeah, and you walk through with your tray and just get bullied. No, <laughs> they're, throwing, um, they're throwing apples at you, but it's a green item. Yeah, you know yeah. I, mean? uh, I would say more so like the sports would stick together more so than like scholarship guys and non-scholarship oh, so guys. So y'all are eating with all the athletes yes. together at one time. So like the rowing girls would be over there. And like you'd see some basketball guys over at this table and like these are mostly football guys. But some people would would know, you know, different athletes and have friends on other teams. So you might end up sitting with them. But for the most part, the sports kind of stuck together. Um, I also feel like that. Is, am I wrong that that would be a good place to try to like meet girls? It, if you're into athletes, like, you know, you're an if, athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing. You, you had to approach it delicately because that part was very middle school. Like you'd have a bunch of guys sitting around and then like all the, you know, there'd be some volleyball girls sitting around. So if, if you got bold and wanted to go chat one of them up, you know, you had to just be prepared for like a bunch of eyes on you and like, Hey, uh, you know, anyway, I'm going to head out. Um, so it, yeah, there was, you could you could shoot your shot, but you just had to be prepared that, you know, she's in a, a hostile environment surrounded by like 10 of her friends. So and that's OK. Is that only for like scholarship players or like who gets into the club? Who gets into uh, the <laughs> who, who, who do they let into the club? Yeah. So football, basketball, baseball, volleyball, track, swimming, rowing, rowing. And Rowan's um, a scholarship at UT. It is there. I think there is. I, so I don't know if there's a club rowing team. There is sub varsity though. Um, at 
you t- so in the same way you'd have like a JV team in high school, right? They have JV rowers, but they were all allowed in there. JV rowers get to go in there. Yeah, sub varsity. So um, there was they were the only other sport that I would say like numbers wise would be comparable to football. Really? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of those gals, and they would use like our weight room at times. Um, wow. Back when. Uh, some of the other sports used to use the same weight room as us. It was like track uh, rowing would come through, but then in the North end zone, as part of that renovation, they built a new weight room that the Olympic sports would use. So rowing track, swimming, diving, anything you'd see in the Olympics, they used that facility up there. And then the other one became kind of just y'all's. Yes. Yeah. Cause baseball and basketball had their own facilities. So we honestly didn't see too much of those guys. Um, I know some of my teammates were friends with some gals on the basketball team, which I personally didn't know any of them. Um, but you'd see them hanging out, you know, periodically, Uh, And a lot of it, too, was kind of predicated on seasons. Mm -hmm. So, like, volleyball had a very similar season to us. There's a lot of overlap. So they'd be on campus going through workouts in the summer at the same time as us and all that stuff. So I would say that was where the most, like, crossover of people knowing uh, athletes from another sport would be was between football and volleyball. Mm. It's it's so weird that like, you know, OK, so from whatever size town you grow up in, you go to UT and y'all and everyone has this like all the athletes as a whole have this link with just sports. Right. And so it's like you're thrown into this club like automatically where someone might join a fraternity or somebody sure. might join a, a club. You're thrown into like a club like immediately. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's such a different dynamic than maybe the experience of a lot of other people, you know? It was really interesting for me because I had come from, uh, like we grew up not like dirt poor, but we grew up pretty broke. Um, I was on a partial academic scholarship and then my mom's parents had left her some money that no one really knew they had. Um, and so that kind of was able to cover the other part of my college. So I got uh, fortunate financially in that regard. You know, it was obviously sad that we lost my grandparents, but, yeah. um, you know, they, they left some money that was kind of earmarked for us to go to school. Um, so, but having that background coming from, you know, not coming from a lot of money, I had that in common with a lot of my scholarship teammates who uh, some of those guys or a lot of those guys, whatever had grown up similarly to me in that regard. But then, um, you know, a lot of my walk on teammates had gotten into UT on their own, were there on their own dime. So some of them came from a little more money family wise, but I had the, the sports, you know, the, the kind of walk on status in common with them. Yeah. So it it was really interesting kind of having different things in common with different groups, uh, where you wouldn't necessarily think of, of that. Uh, so we take the scenario of the, um, low income scholarship guy Mm -hmm. and the, um, paying for my own school walk on guy. Yeah. Right. I'm going to guess that maybe those two guys didn't get along or like it was it, it was probably an interesting dynamic between those kinds of people. Yeah, it, there was just a lot of like kind of cultural exchange, I would say, people learning about different things and which is um, positive. Yeah, it was it was good. I would say way more often than it was bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause you know, you'd get guys like, Hey, you know, what are you doing? Or, uh, what are y'all talking about? Or what's that? You know? And people would be like, Oh, okay. I didn't know about that. You know, I just learned something. Um, and so me kind of having things in common with both groups, I was like a, like a translator almost. I'd be like, <laughs> Oh, we're, yeah, we're talking about this. And I could explain it, you know, in terms to whichever side, you know, didn't know what the other was talking about. Uh, like, Oh, Hey, yeah. You know, think of it like this. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. You know? So it was, it was really interesting kind of that like cultural exchange that would go on, um, you know, just based on whoever you were talking with. Uh, you know, and I can't help but think that, uh, 
uh, that, I mean, it was, the situation was instinctively authentic to you. Like that's, I mean, you were, you were a guy that grew up in a low income, your status is a walk on, you have something similar, both those sides. Mm -hmm. Like it just gives you like a totally different perspective that you, you, you have the thing that the two, each side is missing one of those things yeah. and, and yeah. you have a way of going like, Hey, do you understand this? Hey, you do you understand this? Yeah. And that's a cool kind of spot to be in. It was, it was, and it's allowed me, I feel like to have kept in touch with a lot of guys, um, and still be able to have those conversations. You know, it, you, you overlap with so many people that you're not super close with every single person that you were on the team with. Um, but there are still a lot of guys that I walked on with, which we kind of talked about last time, you know, Logan and Eddie and I were on, um, and there's guys that were scholarship guys, um, you know, that I'm still friends with and still keep in touch with. So that's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, what's the, okay. I, you know, I, I had this plan that I did, I was going to try to avoid talking about football as much as possible, but it's hard. Sure. But, 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 uh, uh, just really quickly, what's like the coolest perk that you ever have gotten or what from playing football, whether it be UT or high school or whatever it is, like what's your, uh, I'm trying to think it kind of helped get me my job, which was cool. That's a really cool. Perk. So that was a big perk. Just So because you played football at UT, someone gave you a job or because you went to UT um, or because you knew somebody from playing football part, parts of all that. So we had like a career services center mm -hmm. and it was one of those things that was there. Not everybody took advantage of it. Um, but I would go up there cause I was, you know, obviously very concerned about trying to get a job at, at when I was graduating. Um, and the most senior person at the Austin facility of the company that I work at had also been a former UT football player. So kind of had the connection there and I still had to interview and like get in. Um, but I, I at least had like a foot in the door and that kind of helped me. Well, everything being equal, you had one more check in your box. Exactly. From, from doing a life experience. Exactly. It's the same. Like it's, we, I think we talked about this before. It's the same thing as being a fraternity. Right. Like if, if, you know, all, you know, like you said, ceteris paribus to use a, uh, 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 economics wait, term. Wait, wait, what'd you just say? Ceteris paribus. What, what does that, that mean? means? All other things being equal. Okay. Uh, see, I learned something new today. There you go. Yeah. I'm gonna put that on a shirt. Some Latin ceteris paribus. Uh, it's like, the, like one the way, thing I like I remember. the way it sounds. Yeah. Ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus. Ceteris. Ceteris. Paribus. Paribus. Now you got it. <sighs> I can't even say it. That's the one thing I remember from econ like <laughs> classes. Um, but yeah, so, you know, all of the things being equal, if I'm up against somebody else that, you know, same qualifications, all that, it's just that extra little leg up of, but I, what I, Oh, what, what I think is so important to recognize about that is that like, if you don't go and do things and you don't have experiences, you don't interact with the world, the universe, people, whatever. Yeah. You don't have these branches. It doesn't, you don't, it, it stagnates your life. It just, you know, the experience of going, going somewhere that you absolutely don't want to go to mm -hmm. could be the best experience of your life. You don't know. Yep. Like you've already, if you've predetermined that's going to suck, then it's going to suck. If you go into it with like, well, I'm just going to see what happens. It could turn into be something great. But if you don't take those opportunities, like trying to walk on at UT, you don't ever see the reward. And I feel like, it's pretty common to hear people say, you know, I wasn't even going to go on this trip or I wasn't even going to apply for that job or I wasn't even going to, you know, and, 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 and it ends up working out or they end up having a great time or they end up meeting people that they become lifelong friends with. And to your point, it just comes down to putting yourself out there. Um, I, I think there's something to be said for being well-rounded and it makes you a lot more relatable to people and you can build rapport with people a lot easier if you've had varied experiences versus if you just stay kind of in your bubble and you don't, uh, you don't branch out. If, if you want to be good at talking to people, you got to go out and talk to people. You can't just talk to the people you always talk to. Exactly. You've already talked to them. You got to go talk to new people. You got to practice. Practice. 
We talking about practice? We talking about practice. It's a muscle, though. You you know you got to work it out. But when you real when you go out and talk to people, and then you experience like people that are real a holes, or you experience people that are really nice, or then someone surprises you and nice when you think they're going to be a jerk, you start to go, oh, well, I'm just going to come to this with the open mind every yeah. conversation, and I can pretty much get myself out of anything. You yeah. know what I mean? But like you don't know that if you don't practice. Sure. Like just saying hi to to the guy at the gas station. Probably nobody, maybe nobody said hi to him today. Just be like, hey, what's up, man? You having a good day? And then, then they'll go like, or like the Uber drivers. Yeah. They'll go, I go, hey, man, how's your day going? He goes, well, let me tell you, my wife. And I'm just like, oh, wow, we're going to jump right into right, it. No warm up. You know what I mean? Let's hear it. Yeah. But I mean, like, it's so interesting that if you just ask somebody how they're doing, maybe something that's on their mind, they get off their chest. It can kind of just, and it makes, now you're having a, com- a conversation. I'm always fascinated by what the Uber yeah. driver is going to say. Uh, it's it's funny that you say that. When I was younger, my dad used to. We were, um, you know, we're we're from an area where a lot of people end up living there as adults. And remind remind me where you're from again. So I'm from a very small town uh, called Friendswood, Texas, mm. and it's halfway between Houston and Galveston. Like hey, right off a of 45 shout out to Billy and Brian. They're like two of my friends. Okay. His wife, uh, Brian is the husband. Billy is the wife. Uh, she has a veterinary clinic in Friendswood. Nice. Yes. And we, yeah. and we go to their house and they have a really nice pool and Brian's a really great cook and makes really strong drinks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Shout Billy. out Billy and Brian. Yeah. Anyways. So he's from, uh, he's from Friendswood. So I'm from Friendswood. My dad's from Galveston and Galveston, I would say is even like a smaller community. Uh, people take a lot of pride in being what's called BOI, born on the island. Um, so, like, that's a big thing. It's kind of like Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, the the mainlanders that are from, you know, the other side of, like, a, a very drivable short bridge. Um, but, you know, we'd be out, and my dad would – you would think, oh, he knows everybody. And he did know a lot of people, but he would just strike up conversations with people and – I remember asking him one day because we were I, I I was wanting to get home or I was like just over it. We were out running errands. And I said, why do you why are you always talking to people? Why are you always just striking up conversations? Do you know them? And he said, no, I don't know them. They're you know, they're strangers, but I'm, I'm just talking to them." And I said, well, you know why you talk to everybody? And he said, you never know when you're going to be the best part of someone's day. They, you know, I, I smile at everybody. I ask everybody how they're doing because they could have been having a terrible day. And that's the only thing that was good that day that they experienced. So you have the opportunity to positively impact people just by being nice and just by saying hi or asking them how they're doing. So, you know, why wouldn't you? Because you you, you see so many people when you're out every day and you could be an asshole to them. And then they'll say, oh, you know, I ran into this guy. He had on, you know, a uh, uh, DJ Screw shirt, and he was just a dick at the Whataburger or whatever. Obviously a drug dealer. He had tattoos. Clearly. Um, or, you know, hey, yeah, I ran into this guy, and he was really nice and asked me, you know, how everything was going. I learned who DJ Screw and, was today. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I had a really nice conversation. So it, I, I've always kind of had that in my mind, and I very much try to approach interactions with people like that. And, you know, you, you do meet some assholes, and some people are just that way. But, you know, hey, maybe your interaction with them made them say, hey, you know, I don't know why I was rude to that guy. I need to I need to be nicer. Well, I, w- I was going to say uh- – you you really embody that from your dad, and you you said when you had come on before uh, that like you just call your friend, you like kind of just bother them, you just keep calling them until yeah. they answer, oh, yeah. and then like make them talk to you for an hour or so or whatever, and like that's your way of like you know checking on your guys and mm-hmm. being that person that your dad talked about, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I have a question. How often and not. When you do that to one of your friends and like you get a hold of them, do they say, um, man, you must have been like really thinking about me. I really needed this today. I'm glad you called me. Does that happen? That happens. I would say maybe every like third or fourth time. So do, do you, well, that, that means you're calling your friends more often, which is great. But do you ever wonder if sometimes like, OK, think of like, do you have a friend that maybe excuse me? He views his life and kind of sees his life so crappy or is making such kind of crappy decisions 
that like every day kind of sucks. So you could call him on any day and it would be the best day you call him because like he's not. Does that make sense? Because sometimes I feel like, man, like I'll reach out to somebody and they'll go, oh, I really needed that right now. And I'm kind of like, OK, so that's God doing his magic of putting us together or do they have enough crappy days that I just hit one of them and that would suck. That's a, that's a good call out. And I, fortunately I don't really have any friends that I call that I, I are just chronically doing that bad that I'm aware of. Um, but okay, is that, is, do you do that by choice? Like, is that your choice to go? No, I, I call, I, I have, like a group of people that I'll just pick up the phone and call. There are some people I'm not as close with that I don't pick up the phone and call because I don't, you know, I'm not interacting with them as often. Um, but I, the the folks that I do, I don't think, it, unless they have that going on and I'm just not aware of it because they don't tell me, but I, I don't think um, those folks are are – having chronically that many like bad days. Are you, are you the kind of guy um, that people tell things to? Yes. <laughs> I hear all the time. I'll just be talking with folks and they'll say random people or your friends. Both. Okay. Uh, they'll say, I don't know why I just told you that. Or man, I've never told anybody that before. And I, I think it's because I'm a pretty open book and I do my best not to just like trauma dump on people and just like talk at people with my shit that I have going on. But I just try and talk about things in an open and honest way. And I do my best not to be judgmental when other people tell me their stuff. I take um, being in people's confidence very seriously. So like if someone tells me something and says like, hey, don't say anything. It, you've, you've seen the meme where it's like, you know, you tell your best friend and then they tell their best friend and then, you know, 10 people know about it. Um, if you tell me something and say, hey, man, you know, keep that on the down low or, you know, don't tell anyone. I'm not going to tell anyone. And then if someone if it gets back to me, I'll act like I haven't heard it before. Right. You know, I'll hear it from a third party and they'll be like, well, I don't know if you knew this. I'm like, no, I didn't know that. That's crazy. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't have said anything because that's not my thing to tell. But you told me that and I'm just learning it for the first time. That's wild. You shouldn't tell anyone else. You know, I, I saw this shirt once that said uh, three can keep a secret if two are dead. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, man, that is that's heavy shit. Uh, one of my favorite shows is uh, Letter Kenny. And one oh, of yeah. their sayings on the show is bad gas travels fast in a small town. Yeah. And uh, so I I do my best not to talk about people when they're not around. That doesn't always work out every single time. This is this is my th this is where I'm at. I I might occasionally talk shit about somebody. I mean, you know, not on purpose, but just maybe not thinking fully through what I'm saying. But if someone comes to me and they go, "Did you say this about me?" and I did, I will 100% own up to you it. You got to wear it because so, you said it. I, I mean, so you know, and if that means like I lose a friend or something like that, then that's that's my bad. That that's sure. on, that's on me. You know what I mean? Like they had, I mean, they also had a decision whether they want to remain friends with me. But like you know, that's kind of on me because I did something, and I have to be oh, cool with that because don't don't be an asshole. Kind of my my addendum to that policy of like not talking about people behind their backs or when they're not around is that I don't say anything. Uh, that I wouldn't like admit to their old saying, face. Like if it came up, like, yeah, if I, I don't, I won't say it behind your back if I wouldn't say it to your face. But a lot of people will say that saying and then won't say things to people's face. That's true. You know what I mean? That's true. So like, if you're gonna, you gotta be able to say it to the face. Yeah. You gotta wear it. Yeah. You know, Is, where'd you, where'd you get that from? You gotta wear it. Where? I don't know where that came from. Uh, I I guess that's just one of those kind Is of generalities from like sports, uh, you know, post game interviews. Um, you know, uh, it's on me. I got to wear that one as the coach or whatever. Just, um, but I, I'm that's a, a saying that I use pretty frequently. Is like, yeah, man, I got to wear that one. Okay, I don't know. Have you do you have you have you watched that Johnny Manziel? Uh, I untold. haven't. Oh, no, shit. I haven't. Okay, I've, so I've seen a lot of memes and I've seen a lot of explanations about it, or you know, posts like giving short recaps and stuff, but I haven't watched it. Oh man. Okay. Well, we're not gonna. I just want to ask real quick because it. I mean, this kid lived varsity blues. Oh not, yeah. Hey, not once but twice. Oh yeah. 
And I was just like, wow. Uh, blue, you know, shades of Blue Mountain State uh, oh, with it. You know, I mean, it's just crazy. I get really pissed off at people like that that are so naturally talented because I was not. And when I see people that had that natural ability or that natural talent that, in my opinion, you know, waste it. And that may be a hot take, you know, whatever, because you could say, well, he, you know, he made it to the NFL, but, you know, he didn't he didn't reach his ceiling because he wanted to party and, uh, you know, throw passes to his agent and his lawyer or whoever the other person was, you know. Um, and it, it's frustrating because I, I think I talked about this last time I was on, but I had to go a million miles an hour every single day to even kind of keep up with dudes that were more naturally gifted than I was. And so when I saw people like squandering that, I was like, God damn it. Okay. If you could just try, you'd be so good. This is what I think. I think one, I think he really didn't want to play football. I think it was just something that he was a really, he's a really good athlete yeah. just in, in general. And with saying that he's a really good high school athlete. He's a pretty darn good college athlete. I mean, but when you said like, you know, like a man, he had all this talent and didn't hit his ceiling. I, th I think it hit a ceiling. He hit a ceiling when he got to the NFL. That was his ceiling. He like, That's fair. he wasn't. And there's an, I mean, you know, like, I would, so like, okay. Hot take. Um, Vince Young, same thing. Oh, those are fighting words. <laughs> but I mean, okay, I mean, but let's look at Vince. Let's look at Vince Young. Okay. So he goes to a high school. You know, like he's the shit at high school, right? Yep. He goes to college. He can he can do what he did in college. Should have won the Heisman, but right. that's that's another podcast. But then he gets to the NFL, and the, his limitations you could just at a minimum say were kind of maybe himself or situations he put himself into or whatever. Like he, that's where he hit his. And I like. Don't get me wrong. Like I like. like sure. I like Vince Young, but I I I watched the Johnny Manziel thing, and I was like, man, this is like just feels like Vince Young. And then Johnny Manziel comes on, and he goes, my favorite athlete was Vince Young. And Brett Favre. And I was like, oh, I'm a big Brett Favre fan. And okay. I was like, okay, so you got my dude alike. You got it. And like, I don't know. So that's interesting because I've I've never really thought about people. I, I think we kind of put people on a pedestal and we think, oh, man, if you would just do this and this and this and this, your ceiling could be, you know, so high. But um, I, I guess I don't take into account that, you know, people's own personal emotional, mental, whatever limitations are a part of, you know, what their ceiling is. So that's a good point. That's interesting. Do you, are you familiar with the guy, Chris Heron? He came and spoke to us, uh, one time when we were at Texas. Okay. What, what, what was your impression of him? Uh, it was really interesting. It was a good talk. We were in the bass concert hall at UT, which is a, a big venue and we went and we're sitting kind of in the front row, but there was folks, I guess, from other groups or like from the community. Like he wasn't talking to us like in our house, As whatever, it, in our facility. Yeah. So it was open. just went. Yeah, we went. And uh, it was interesting because I guess there were other folks in the audience that were like in recovery or had been dealing with addiction. And so he would tell parts of his story. And as someone who hasn't experienced that, you know, you're just hanging on every word he says, but there's people in the audience that are laughing and I'm thinking like, Oh my gosh, that's so disrespectful. And he kind of, you know, pauses the show and says, Hey, look, I know that y'all are laughing because you've been through the same thing and it's relatable to you, but we have some folks here that are not in recovery who, who may not understand on the level that you do. So I'll ask y'all to like, not, laugh and not like make light uh because you know there there are some folks in here listening for some different reasons right so that was really interesting but i really liked um kind of his messaging and what he had to say there was one part of his talk that really stood out where he talked about uh shaving in the shower because he didn't want to look himself in the mirror and uh, he said one day he he just stopped doing that, you know, when he was a little further along with his recovery. And he he realized, like, man, I haven't, you know, looked myself in the eyes in the mirror in a really long time. Um, so that always stuck with me. Um, I, I So what I think about 
so you know his basketball feats, right? Yes. Like he yeah. would just get like loaded the night before, not sleep, go mm-hmm. out and drop like 40. Yeah. You know what I mean? Kind of stuff. And I think personally, as great as he was at basketball, that was not what he was put on this earth to do. Sure. What he was put on this earth to do is what he's doing. Right. And I think that in the case of like as like a Johnny Manziel, he has an opportunity to do a, similar things you know football was just something he did it got him to here but what could he but if he doesn't do that he's capping his own ceiling sure you know what i mean like he's he's deciding that being a failure in the nfl is as high as he wants to go yeah Uh, failure that's that's rude is that rude i mean is he a bust I would say, yeah. Do you know why I don't think he's a bust? Why? Because when he got drafted, they were like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> and so, like, you can't have, like, a draft pick like that and then think it's a bust. Like, because there were so many people that it's like Aaron Rodgers was drafted so late. And you're like, was well, everybody in front an idiot because they didn't take sure. him? You know? So would you say he was less of a bust and more of a gamble then? A gamble that just didn't pan out? I think, well, I mean, if you want to go to my quarterback theories, I'm not, I'm one, I'm not getting the guy that short. I'm not picking a dude that fair. small. Okay. That's but like, fair. let's say I did. I think at best, like, you know, like, okay, so he's coming out of college and there's just some like shady stories and things around him. Sure. Like, and we're not talking about like he's like six five two forty, like just has a cannon. We're talking about he runs around like throwing the ball. So like, there was a lot of risk there. Yeah, so much risk that like no one thought he would get picked there, and then he does. And so then you go, well, I mean, I guess they thought it was worth it. Yeah, I I think there is something to that, you know, as much as everybody loves to say, well, you know, it's it's not the size of the fight or not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog, but like, you know, look at Kyler Murray, he won a Heisman and then he went to the league and he's been injured and I don't wish injuries on anybody, but you know, they're just at at a point facts are facts, he's a small guy. You know, and he's out there getting beat up and you know, he's been dealing with injuries. Well, you know, um, uh, you know, what could we go? We could talk about the running quarterback, right? But like, if the running quarterback doesn't look like Michael Vick or the size of Michael Vick, yeah, like, I don't want to talk about it, right? Because, like, you know, there's no, I mean, you're putting yourself in that much more danger, exactly. Every play, no matter how good your offensive line is, at some point when you're past them, you're, you're, you're chopped liver, you're, yeah, you're on your own, you're on your own. So, I mean, you know, like, yeah, I, you know, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm personally not doing small quarterbacks and I'm not taking a guy that has a lot of controversy really quickly though. Was miles Garrett, the first pick in that draft, the Browns took, who did Browns take earlier in that draft? Do you remember? It may have been miles Garrett. Cause I'm just, I don't know. I don't remember. No, they took, maybe they took a corner. Ooh, I can't remember. All I'm going to say is they must have felt so confident because they had two picks in that round. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, if we shit this one, we yeah. still got we still got this other one. We still got this other one in but our we, back We can pocket. take a chance. Yeah, that's still a big ass chance. Man, could have been. I don't know. Like I said, I guys like that always frustrated me because, uh, you know, and maybe that's me projecting on them. You know, maybe I I unfairly hold those guys to a higher standard. But as somebody who is not supernaturally gifted and uh, you know athletic, it was always just like when are you going to get it? Like if, if we could switch bodies or, you know, if, if, if I had that level of athleticism or whatever with the work ethic that I have, my ceiling would be, you know, however much higher than it is, you know, now. Okay. We'll say that, um, like you, you have Johnny Manziel's career, but you know, like it, there's no, there's no drinking and partying and everything. You're like, you're on your shit working as hard as you can. And then that's where it stops. Yeah. Would you feel like that you did not maximize your talent? Does that make sense? Like, cause we feel like he wasted his talent because of all this other shit. Sure. But at, at a simple, at a simple thing, like what you said, like he just didn't like my opinion, he just didn't have the work ethic. Yeah. He, he just didn't want to do it. He, I don't think he wanted to play football anymore. So he didn't. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, you know, like Todd Marinovich, you remember like, oh, like yeah. he gets to the league. And That's then one of my favorite 30 for 30s. Uh, it's one of the best. It's one of the best. And Chris Herons is really good too. It's I called haven't, uh, Unguarded. I haven't seen his, oh, but I should so, watch it. It's so good. It's so good. Because he's just talking about dropping 40 and getting drunk the next, yeah. you know, the whole next yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think he just didn't, he just didn't have the work ethic. And even if he hadn't been doing all that other stuff, that I think that's probably about as far as it would have went. And I, I feel like that in and of itself is just kind of a part of being involved with any sort of athletics is that I, I think there's maybe only, man, a, a small handful of people that don't look back and say, you know, man, if I could have just done this or done this, or if I could have just won this additional thing, because you, you see a lot and you read a lot about people that, uh, you know, win a Super Bowl, for example, and then they fall into a depression. And part of that is just with how the human brain works, you know, the, your, your body resets what the standard for dopamine levels are and serotonin. Uh, but I, I think part of it too, is that um, you know, those achievements can only make you feel so good. And it's like, okay, you know, how many people that have won Super Bowls and been just like dudes that were on that team, like the 52nd, 53rd guy on that roster, you know, do you think they take a lot of satisfaction and hang their hat on? Well, I have a Super Bowl ring, uh, you know, two, three years in the league guys versus you look at like uh, Randy Moss, you know, one of the all time greatest receivers and he didn't have a ring. How, how do you feel about uh, Randy Moss's lack of worth ethic, work ethic? Uh, I mean, again, you know, do, do you point to his lack of a ring as like he didn't reach his ceiling? Well, I was meaning more that like, you know, notoriously, like he just really didn't want to practice and like he would just go out and ball out on game day. He was it, it, there were guys like that that I was like, man, that is frustrating because I can't do that. But it's hard to argue with results, you right. know. So it, so is that not diminishing marginal returns then? You know, if they if they attend that extra film session, you know, how how much more could they have done? It it was really tough for me when when football was coming to an end because I didn't feel like I had reached what where I wanted my ceiling to be, but to your point realistically for me playing college football like that was it. That was probably as good as I was going to do. Do you ever look back at your experience and go, if I would have worked, I won't say worked harder, but like as an example, like maybe I had gone out and partied less or if I had done this, that and other, maybe I would have gotten a scholarship. Maybe I would have got or do you feel like you gave it the maximum that you had that time? being like, like, Oh, it included, like, I enjoyed being in college. Does that make sense? So I really didn't party. Like I didn't drink before I turned 21. Um, and that was, that was like a family thing. That was just something my grandpa had like made me promise him when I was a very young man, my namesake grandpa. And you stuck to it. And I stuck to it. God bless. So I'm, I'm earnest. And you're from a small town. Yeah. Yeah. So not, not small. Like, you know, people are getting drunk in the cornfield. Oh, that's, that's my spot. Like I'm from the suburbs. Like let's not, you know, (laughs) romanticize it too much. Smaller area. Smaller. yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm, so I'm Ernest William Gonzalez, the third is my government name. And uh, so Ernest William Gonzalez Sr. was my grandpa. And he, when I was very young, was like, you know, hey, uh, you're going to do a lot of things and we know you are, but you got to kind of stay on the straight and narrow. And kind of gave me that talk and made me promise him I wasn't going to, you know, drink and do all that. And so I, I did. And that was just something I took very seriously. And so I, I really didn't drink before I turned 21. So uh, in, in that regard, you know, I was, I was giving it my all on that front. I think we kind of touched on this last time I was on, but there were some things where, you know, I, I didn't really know how to watch film and be like a student of the game type player. Did y'all do that in high school? We watched film once a week when I was in high school and it was usually just reviewing like game tape from the night before. But, uh, you know, I was a shithead 16, 17 year old kid. No, so nobody's we, watching game. Yeah, film. we're more just like clowning on people that got pancake blocked and stuff like that. Text, texting your girlfriend. Yeah. So 
Um, I, for me to have done any more than I did, I would have needed to be like a, a Luke Keekly, like just have this supernatural understanding of, you know, film and game breakdowns and things like that. So, I mean, okay, let me ask you this. Did you, did you walk away from your experience at UT like satisfied? Yes and no. Um, I think in order for me to be happy with being on the team at Texas, I had to figure out what my role was and then embrace that. Because if you hold yourself to the standard of like, the only way I was going to be successful is if I was a scholarship starter at Texas, you're going to probably be disappointed. And I, I would even find that in talking with people from my hometown. Like when I was going to go off to college. Um, it was like, Oh, well, you know, Hey, uh, I heard you're applying for UT. That's a really tough school. You might not get in. And so I got into Texas and then it was like, well, Hey, you know, it sucks. You're not going to be able to play football anymore. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to try and walk on. And it was, Oh, you know, those are some big guys. You you could get hurt. And I was like, well, you know, maybe, but I, I might also not, you know, so I, I walked on and then it was like, well, you know, it sucks that you'll never play. And then I played and it was like, well, it sucks. That you'll never be a starter. So it, there's just, you know, yes. And yes. And yes. And like, okay. At a certain point, you know, me being, you know, five eleven, uh, 215 pounds at the time, not anymore. Uh, at the time, like being a D one college football player, like that's pretty fucking good for me. So, right. um, I, it didn't go quite the way I had hoped, but I ultimately learned to appreciate it for what it was and enjoy the experience. I think I thought about this a lot. Like, why do the people that are supposed to be on your side the most like kind of go like, hey, you don't don't, don't you know, it's you might fail or you're probably going to fail. Just like just to let you know, like, you know, you're going to try to probably walk on, but you're not going to get it. You know what I mean? So why? Yeah, I, they, but I think they do that because they care about you. Sure. And they don't want to see you hurt. Yeah. But hey, people that do that, you're also fucking up my dreams. Like, you know, yeah. like just be a supporter. Like if I fail, I'll be fine. I don't need you to soften it for me. Right. Yeah. Like, does it you know what I mean? Yeah. And and. I think there are kind of two sides of it. I think people that are genuinely in your corner that say things like that are kind of concerned for your well-being. Um, I think there are people that are, um, you know, have regrets or are like jealous that they didn't get those opportunities and they're trying to detract from what you're doing. They're, they're taking their life experiences and exactly. kind of like putting them on you. They're trying to, they're qualifying and trying to take away. Cause that'd be like, you know, if, if you knew somebody that um, was a musician and, oh, well, Hey, you know, uh, you'll never play anywhere. Well, you know, I'm playing at the bar and, oh, well, you know, that's all you'll ever do. You'll never be George Strait. You know, you'll never be Guns N' Roses. Like, okay, well, is is that, is it either you are that, like the pinnacle of your field or you're a complete failure? There's so much space or in between there to be. there's shades of gray in between where, you know, hey, I, I did pretty good for me. You know, I'm making 50 bucks every Thursday yeah, at this exactly. little small bar or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? The people like, uh, as a parent, people do that to you a lot too. They'll go, I'll go, well, I'm going to try this from the daughter and go, well, you let's, let's see how that works. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I, I am going to see. I really, I, I've already made up my mind. This is the way I'm doing things. I appreciate that you care about me enough that you have an opinion, but uh, respectfully, I'm yeah, I'm gonna see. Like, and I'll be fine with the results because I made this decision. You gotta wear it. Yeah, you gotta. There you go. You gotta yeah. wear it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, um, it's really easy to get like I don't say mad as a parent, but like get kind of defensive about it. And I and I don't because I just understand that that's those people's experience. Sure. That you know are trying things new, not working or whatever. But I mean, you know, with my daughter, like I don't look them. I look them as as attempts. Yeah. These that's attempt one, attempt two, yeah. attempt three. Captain's log, uh, <laughs> July eleventh. You know, we tried this with potty training, and she peed all over the floor. All yeah. right, yeah, all right. Scratch, Scratch that one. Yeah. Back to the drawing board. You know, <laughs> um, yeah. But I, you know, like I said, I, I think I think there are people that are well intentioned, and I think there are people that are just being ugly. Well, I think the people that are being ugly maybe just haven't dealt with their shit. 
I yeah. mean, that would be a real easy way to, I mean, that, would, but probably more than likely. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, like, you know, don't, you know, a lot of times it's not about you. You know, when yeah. somebody's mean to you, it's not about you, especially if it comes out of nowhere. You should like recognize like if someone's kind of a dick out of nowhere, like, oh, man, maybe they're having a bad day. Yeah. Like, I don't I don't know you that well. And you're reacting this way towards me. Like, I'm I'm not the problem here. Like, you have some other stuff going on. I'm just like the outlet for what you're upset about. Well, but I think the I, I don't know, as a person, the best thing you can do for a person that's doing that is just like let them have it. Mm -hmm. not, not, let, not let them have it. Let them be that and I don't respond and let them sit in that. And uh, like, maybe they need to get that out or maybe they need to adjust to an idea or something like that. And when you respond immediately to that kind of stuff, sometimes it doesn't allow them to process it. Yeah. And, and, and recognize that it's theirs. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, like give some people some space, you know what I mean? Man, it's uh it's so funny. I feel like as we get older and especially like as men, you know, we, uh, there's a lot of commentary made about hobbies and things like that. And I've learned that any hobby you can spend as much money as you care to on whatever hobby you've chosen. Like I own a lot of cowboy boots and, you know, I buy Tacovas. shout out to Kova, sponsor me. Uh, no, I buy Tacovas because you can get uh, exotics for like a, a reasonable price. Um, whereas, you know, you could go up to the Lou Casey's and above where you're spending, you know, several thousand dollars. What, what, what kind of snakes are they killing? Yeah, exactly. Like some kind of rare snake you can exactly. only get. Exactly. Um, is it even snake? Don't know. Don't know. Going to get some bald Eagle boots. No, I don't even think that would work. Um, but no, you know, everybody talks, oh, well, you know, my wife loves shoes or my girlfriend loves purses or whatever. But like, it, it's all the same. It's one of those things like whatever you care to spend money on, on whatever hobby you can cocaine. spend as much as you want. Cocaine, if I you're mean, so inclined. But that, I mean, that really is like every you you spend you decide where you spend your money. Yeah. Some people waste it. Gambling, drugs. Mm -hmm. Some people spend it on shoes. But if you ask people, them, boots. would they consider that wasted money? No, they probably wouldn't. They at, probably wouldn't. At that time. At the time. Yeah. You know, so like this is what's so weird. So doing the podcast at this point is my hobby. Sure. Right. There's like, some, like, wing, there's no, there's no income at this point. I'm still doing it for fun. Yet. Right. Yet. Yet. Because your ceiling with the podcast is wherever you want it to be. That's right. But I mean, I, but I, but I'm cool with it. I really enjoy it. I, I love doing this. It's like so much fun. Like, and my girlfriend's tired of talking to me, but what I find is, is the more I get into the podcast, the more I start selling my shoes. Yeah. Because I can't, ha you can't have both. Sure. You know what I mean? So like I, there is stuff that I'm keeping that I'm a collector, but there's a lot of stuff going out the door too, so that I can do this. And I think that's a very healthy exchange because I'm now I'm being a creator versus being a consumer. Yeah. And, and there's definitely something to be said for like, as you move into new and different hobbies, like, do you have all the shit from the other one that you did? You know, like you, you see people that, you know, whatever, like, Oh yeah, I got really into archery. So I bought this badass bow and all these arrows and stuff. And now it sits in the garage, but then I kind of got into, you know, insert another kind of expensive hobby. And then they just have all these like just boxes of stuff that they're not using anymore versus, you know, Hey, yeah, I, I was really into archery for a minute and then I wanted to get into this other thing. So I got rid of this stuff and now I'm, I'm doing this now I'm doing photography or whatever the case may be. I'm not criticizing my parents because they're the people that raised me, but I'm going to tell you this. My parents were really good about like, so example, like in junior high, I was like, I'm going to play tennis. Okay. And my parents, like they were, they were great to me. So they gave me like, I had the bat, these badass Andre Agassi like shoes Heck and yeah. like his whole outfit and like a really badass racket that was like f carbon fiber or something like that or whatever. Right. And surprise, surprise, I sucked at tennis and I didn't do it very long. And like, whereas I'm appreciative that my parents like did that for me, I'm telling you, as God is my witness right now, I'm buying my daughter the shittiest tennis racket. Oh, yeah. And make sure that she wants to play tennis first. Yeah. And if you can play tennis with a shitty tennis racket, then we can buy a good one. 
Thank you, parents, for doing it for me. But on some level, like y'all shouldn't have wasted y'all's money. Like I and I can't believe they did it over and over again. And now as an adult, I'm like, man, that was like and having a kid, I was like, that was I'm a dick. <laughs> but you know, at when at what point, you know, were they uh raising the next, you know, Andre Agassi or you know, Johnny McEnroe, maybe if you were a little spicy as a tennis player. I think th- I think they were just trying to be supportive in the best way they knew how. Sure, sure. Um, and um, maybe what makes a person successful is not the thing, not the things you provide them, but the things that you give them while doing it right it's not the the tools you provide them with it's the way they use those tools or it's the way you encourage them to use what you gave yeah like okay i was really bad at badass at a a target shooting okay right and i shot the shitty rifles that like they gave us in 4-h to like shoot forever and then when i showed dedication my parents actually bought me i was left-handed they bought me my own left-handed rifle which was not cheap but I was super dedicated. That was a good that pair. Hey, mom and dad, that was a good, <laughs> that good, was a good, good investment. Yeah. And they sold that rifle for, for close to the same amount of money because it was left handed. There you go. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a big believer in like scaling equipment to the level. Did your, what did you, how did your parents handle it? Because you play football pretty much probably all the time, right? So football actually wasn't the first sport that I played. Um, Football came in a little later. After water polo? (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, (laughs) no, horse polo first uh, with miniature horses because I was a a young kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't Uh, use full-size horses. Yeah. You'll never even be able to reach the ground with the stick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, And then Greco-Roman wrestling and uh then football third yeah uh no but i they had didn't have to invest a lot in greco-roman wrestling right like you just need a like a towel loincloth, a loincloth. shoes yeah you know. that's it um, sandals i mean no i got pretty much like you remember uh uh and you you may not remember but like rolling cleats that they used to sell at walmart oh yeah i was had the rolling walmart cleats would you say Okay, when when I was when I was younger, when I got into high school, they there were a little some bit more. Uh, there were some Nike. I think they were called Nike Land Sharks. That were like thirty bucks, and so if you played, Friendswood was a very wealthy city. Was and it still is. We were not wealthy. We just happened to live there. So if we played a school from like a lower income area, you'd see a lot of land sharks out on the field and then me and mine. And then dudes that I played with had the like badass, you know, Under Armour or the badass Nike, like vapor cleats, whatever. And uh, I didn't. Um, Man, growing up in Friendswood, uh, you, I mean, kids had, so to your point, like about the tennis, like the badass carbon fiber, you know, you'd be out next to some kid who was also in like ninth grade playing football. And I mean, this kid looked like a Dick's sporting goods Ad. or an Academy, like sponsored athlete or like, like the mannequin in the front. Yeah. Like they just, they took the catalog in there and they said, just do this, I'll do this, just I want bring this. me this. And then, you know, you'd have, uh, you know, me in my ankle socks and Walmart cleats. Like, all right, yeah, let's do this. So was like, was the badass carbon fiber tennis racket, like your participation trophy for tennis. I mean, in a way, but here I thought about this when you were talking. So these are my two choices was the badass like carbon fiber racket or my mom had a tennis racket that she had like in high school. That was one of those wooden ass like ones. Wood. The whole thing. No, no, the whole thing's wood. The yeah. whole thing is wood. And like that was going to be my other option. And I'm sure like as a kid, I was like, I can't I can't the, like you know, it's like Will Smith, like uh, bitching about his clothes. Like, yeah, I can't, I can't use this. You got to give me something cooler. Yeah. And I was probably an asshole about it and was like, I wanted this. And my parents were nice. Uh, there's so I, I, as I mentioned, I grew up kind of, you know, broke, especially for Friendswood. Uh, there's two things that I remember having like big fucking arguments with my parents about as a kid. And they weren't so much arguments so much as I was like crying and whining about it. One of them was in third grade, the recorder 
the the requisite like stereotypical recorder that we all played as children and one of them was nike presto cages when i was in the fifth grade if you remember those okay which one are those so they were a pull-on shoe and they had like this rubber kind of I don't know if you'd call it like webbing, yeah. but where the laces were, there was this rubber kind of overlay and uh, they were, if you didn't have them, man, you were not cool. And uh, so the, the recorder thing they had, you know, they sent the little catalog home and you could order one or there was just a box of recorders like in the corner that you could use. And I just remember I got it in my head that if I used the school recorders, like that was gross because other people had been using them. And then I was just going to get made fun of and I was going to get like, was that a thing of like, that's what the poor kids did. So part of it was that I think part of it was that I had that in my Mama. head. Sure. And because there were kids that, you know, I mean, you you remember those fundraisers you do when you're a kid and you have the kid whose parents are like, yeah, whatever, you know charging on the card or whatever. Uh, so we, anytime stuff like that would go home, my parents were like, no, hey, you know, you don't need that stuff. That's all just crap, you know, whatever. Um, so the recorder, I remember just like, I was crying. I was upset. I was eight, you know, and I told them like, if I don't have my own recorder, I'm going to get made fun of. And they they sat me down. This was like, this was a big deal. They, they took me off into, uh, we called it the garage room. It was a, had been a garage and had been closed in. I, I, um, I've been in one of those four. Not as nice as this. <laughs> um, Step it up. But uh, they, they sat me down and they said, you know, hey, why are you so upset about this? And I had to explain to them. And they said, okay, if it means that much to you, because I think the recorder was like 12 bucks. You know, it wasn't a matter of money. It was the principle of it. Um, they said, you know, Hey, if you're this upset and if it means this much to you, we will get you one. And of course, you know, I get it. And I remember it was like this translucent blue plastic with like silver glitter in it. And I got it. And like day one, all the rich kids who I thought were going to have these badass recorders, just go get in line and get the ones out of the box in the corner and there's like five or six of us that bought them. And it was like, why did you do that? And I just remember in that moment being like, this is what my parents were talking about. I feel so ridiculous right now because I was so upset. And like, how dumb was that? But just like, but that, and, but that was kind of, it was all a scenario kind of made up in your head. It was a hundred percent up here. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like, and it's, I mean, how, I, all I could think of was like how great of your parents of trying to kind of really break it down, like as best as you can with a kid. Sure. Of like, you know, like, because like they they went back to the bedroom and they're like, can you believe this fucking shit? They're like this little asshole. Like, 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 like they go, th your parents are like, this doesn't matter. And they're like, I know it doesn't matter, but like it matters to him. It's the principle and of it. And they're talking about it. They, just knowing that like. You know, like us talking about it now, you're like, oh, that's ridiculous. But like it meant so much to you. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, as a parent, your kids, I don't want to say you want to reward them in them in those moments. But there's some times where you should like come to their their honor of like those small little things and just do it for you. Sure. And that you have the experience of like, oh, I'm one of the five douchebags. And that then, yeah, I got, I got egg on my face now as like the kid who owns a recorder, you yeah. know. But th there was that, yeah, and then the shoes, I don't remember that conversation. I just remember I was really upset because they came out and everybody had them and I didn't. Um, but I, I used to tell I, – I had this conversation with my mom probably annually, and my, my dad's no longer with us, but I would tell him, you know, when he was still around, that, like, one of the best things they ever did for me was to tell me no. And I say that because there was a lot of kids that I grew up with that had a lot more means and came from a lot more money and were never told no and have just turned into just burnouts, just fuck ups. The classic like small town kid had everything growing up, never got told no, never had consequences until they went to big boy consequences like with the law. And so I, I would tell my parents all the time, like them telling me no made me learn that like it's not about to your point earlier, it's not about the the tools necessarily that we give people, but how they use them. And uh, so I, I was really appreciative to them 
for that. Do you think without them telling you no, that you would have walked on at UT? Um, I, well, <clears throat> part of that was just due to, I wasn't done with football. Um, I don't, I don't think them telling me no necessarily factored into that. They were actually kind of split on that. My dad was like, no, that you're going to do it. I believe in you. And my mom was like, well, you're going to get hurt. I don't know if you should play college football at first. I mean, she was extremely supportive of me, but, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it, it played as much into football so much as it has just like my daily life as a as a person as I've gotten older and understanding the difference between wants and needs and being able to, um, you know, kind of reconcile that. I, I was telling somebody the other day, I was like, uh, before I had my child. I made enough money that like, I didn't have to necessarily have a budget. You know what I mean? I could sure. just kind of free and loose. Treat yourself. Yeah. But then once you have a kid, you're like, oh shit. Yeah. There is another person in here eating food and, and burning money and has no job. Yeah. No, no, no incomes coming in from this freeloading this free all over the place. And you go, man, I really got it. Like, and so like I, I've, I've made new priorities and stuff and yep. it's like next, it's like next level. Like I, I didn't, I didn't know I I had heard this life existed from people that had children. Sure. But I was like, y'all are just poor at managing y'all's money. Like if you're broke, just say that. Yeah. You but, know? but then you get into it and you're like, oh man, Damn. like you're like, school is that much? Like what? It's uh it's like the meme where it's the guy like in the boxing gloves and it says, I'm gonna fight, you know, whatever it is. And then the next panel down, he's like, This motherfucker got hands. <laughs> like, I'm gonna fight this budget. And they're like, oh, this budget got hands. Oh um, man, that budget has hands. Yeah, it's it's really funny though, and it, it that kind of goes into what I was talking about earlier about having some of those experiences in common with dudes on the team that had grown up, you know, without a bunch of money. Um, but it it's interesting. It it makes you grow up a little quicker in some regards. Just having to be confronted with like. My parents did a very good job making sure we always had what we needed, but they were also very honest with us about the fact we weren't going to have everything we wanted. And I think that was a very important distinction. I think, I think that's very fair. Yeah. Like I don't want my child to ever not have the things she needs. Sure. And I want her to have the things she wants. But like not everything, you know, like I want a lot of things and they're not always achievable at this moment. And like I was thinking about like as like a parent and when when talking to people about what their parents do, like, you know, when you wanted those shoes, like I wonder if your parents have gone to you. OK, so you want these shoes. OK, so we're going to get them. OK. And now you owe us seventy eight dollars. Yeah. And you need to figure out how you're going to pay that off to us, you know, like and and just teaching that. My parents did that. It didn't work out great because I'm still poor with money. <laughs> but at least I learned work. Sure. You know what I mean? At a minimum, I learned work, I guess, you know. And I think if you have that as a fallback, you're already ahead of some folks. Like you can always, if you have a good work ethic, you can always work yourself out of, um, unless you, you know, you really fuck up and you commit like a crime or, you know, you do something bad. You can always work your way out of things if you are willing to work hard enough to do that. Yes. To a degree. Well, I just think like, you know, mm, you don't want to decide where your ceiling is, but you don't get to decide where your ceiling is. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. You, you know, like you don't want to preset it yourself, but you don't want to... If you hit your ceiling, that you know, like that's your ceiling. So yep. is that's as much you're gonna make at that job, that's as far as you're gonna go in a sport, whatever. Sure. Like, you know, you can put in more work, but that might that might be it. And that's the like when I say you can work yourself out of a situation, it's not like Kim Kardashian saying, like, people just need to get up and work. But like if if I really fell on hard times, like they're manual labor, like construction, landscaping jobs out there where it's like, you know, what will you do in order to get by? And pay the bills, you know, until something else breaks loose for you. I I got to think that either life is really hard for you, like mentally, or um, you just don't want to fucking do shit. If like, because I think about, OK, so what if I lost my job today? Sure. I mean, I, 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 I feel confident that I could get another job. 
It might not be the job. I might, I might be pre-qualified to work at Freebirds because I look like this. But like, <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? I think I can get a job. I think I can get a job making burritos. Sure. So, you know, I don't sometimes I don't understand. I'm like, it has to be more than just that. Like, why do they not? Why do people that don't want to work? I don't know how I got on the subject. Like, what? why are they lacking the willpower for themselves? Sure. For their for their lives, just in general. You know what I mean? And that I, that kind of goes in not to keep going back to football, but it, there's just a lot of applicable. Well, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to avoid it. I, I think we're stuck here. <laughs> there's a lot of applicable things from that. And when I talked about embracing my role, like sometimes you're holding a a shield or like a dummy for somebody. And if you had come out of high school thinking you were hot shit and you're like, no, I'm too good for that. I'm not doing that. Okay. Well, that's what you're being asked to do right now. And if you want to do the things that you want to do, you got to do some of the things you don't want to do. That's right. And so like when I got my job, I was had my brand new shiny college degree and I was going to go make six figures. And uh, I ended up on a delivery truck in third ward in Houston in the summer with no AC. And it's like, okay, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And I did not like my old job. So for five years, I did a job that I did not like because it was going to get me to where I needed to be and wanted to be. And you hear different philosophies on that. I had friends that were like, man, I work in tech. You should quit. You should, you know, I've, I've changed jobs six times in the last three years, whatever. But for me, I like stuck with it. And now I love my job. And so it was like, well, what are you willing to do? And how much are you willing to put up with if it's going to get you to where you want to be? Surprise, surprise. To get to something that you love to do, you're going to have to work. Yeah. Nobody's going to fucking just hand it to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're going to have to work for less like your like the your payment probably is not going to be quite where you want it because you're earning that future payment. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But I think that that's a hard thing for people to do, especially in a society that needs like immediate gratification and satisfaction. Yeah, it's like, well, I put up one video, like you don't like to share what you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, and it's just not like that. You release one episode of the podcast, and you're not like Joe Rogan level like income. Well, and that's what's so crazy is like you know, like when I go back and I watch the first episode of the podcast, I'm like, holy fuck. You're like, who's that guy? Well, I'm just like, I'd like, I know why I put it on the internet, but then I'm like, why did I put that on the internet? But it established, I had to establish the first step. There had to be a first step. And without putting it out for people to hear and see, I, I'm not really make, I'm making that step like behind closed doors. Yeah. But I'm not opening myself up to criticism and growth and all that other jazz. It's like putting like, it's like, you know, if you don't put yourself out to be a walk on, there is no opportunity to be a, a scholarship player at UT. And, and I think, you know, I, I don't have a podcast, but podcasting as a medium is interesting because, um, you know, George Strait or, uh, you know, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, whoever, um, I'm, I'm just thinking of people that are like well-known in their genre. They, you know, their early sessions at a bar where they broke a string and they were out of tune and their voice cracked. That's not by and large, that's not on the internet forever. You know, now we're, we're entering an, an era where people's old stuff, where they performed at the county fair and, you know, uh, tractor pull, you know, you can go pull it up on YouTube of somebody that's big now, but, uh, podcasting, it's like, it's on there. So your first one where you watch it and maybe are a little cringy about it, like it's, it's on there forever. And, you know, people can still go watch it if they want to. I thought about this the other day. So like, um, you, you were you a bone thugs and harmony fan or am I too old? Okay. Come on now. I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm pretty old, man, I guess comparatively. Cause you said something while ago and I was like, Oh man, like I remember that was like straight up going on. Um, so me and my uh, best friend and, and college were big Bone Thugs fans. And, you know, and like we were just anything, anything Bone Thugs, anything, anything. Yep. And I remember they had released like maybe two CDs and that like what is enough for us. And then they retro released like one of their like mixtapes or something before they had a okay. CD. And like we had to get it. And when you listen to that shit, it's not that great. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like we were so into it, we wanted to hear everything. Sure. And I think as 
people and as humans, we kind of, we want to see, we want to see car wrecks. We want to see mistakes. We still want to see growth and things like that. We love the story, the story of people growing. And so when you don't put that out there, you don't make that transition. Like people, they don't uh, naturally gravitate to it. I think. People love an underdog story, but more than that, they love to see people fail. But why? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's I I I always go back to I, I think people that are just haters, like that word gets overused a lot, but people that truly just like to shit on things that other people do, I think it comes from a place of they are envious, whether they'll admit it to themselves or not, about other people's ability to put themselves out there. The FOMO is real. Like if you see somebody out on the dance floor making an ass of themselves and you make like, oh, look at this guy. It's like, OK, but where are you making that comment from? Are you sitting at the table watching somebody dance going, man, that guy sucks at dancing? OK, well, cool. You're you're sitting at your table at the wedding reception, not doing anything. Well, let me challenge you this. Who do you think's having a better time? Exactly. Exactly. He's making a fool of himself. He's not harming anybody. He's just making, he's harm, like harming himself, but like he's probably having a better time. Dude's having a blast. I mean, he ain't worried about shit. It, it's, it's crazy how much more fun you can have when you're not worried about what other people are thinking about you. So we, we talk about it in terms of putting yourself out there in terms of like wanting to achieve some sort of goal or success with an endeavor. But I think even more so than that, there is, you know, just having fun or, you know, hey, I can't sing all that well, but I love this song and I'm going to belt it out or I'm going to go up and sing karaoke and it's going to suck and people are probably going to laugh. But I'm up on stage singing a song I love or dancing or whatever, you know, I, I feel like that a lot of these moments are just such there's such blimps in your life, really. Yeah. You know what I mean, if you get up in some bar seeing karaoke one night. I mean, it's such a it's such a small part, especially if you go do a bunch of other shit. If that's the only thing you do and you have a bad experience, well, then probably you're going to view that from a bad light. Sure. But like if you do a bunch of stuff, you know, and then you have really great experiences, you don't worry too much about those small blimps of whatever, you know. Well, and, you know, like we were saying earlier about being well-rounded and just having different experiences. How many of those people that sit there and like to point and laugh, you know, go to their grave with like, Oh man, you know, I never sang karaoke or I never did this, or I didn't, I never danced. I didn't get up and go ask that girl to dance at a wedding or I didn't, you know, whatever, whatever it was, you know, I didn't do it cause I was scared. You know, what fucked me up is, uh, I was a pretty, uh, like I wasn't very suave. I didn't go up to girls and talk to them, stuff like that. And, uh, I remember there was this nightclub in, uh, Victoria, Texas, um, you know, huge place. Uh, and I asked this one girl to dance and she shot me down and that ruined me for like years that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I just, I, the first experience I had in doing that didn't go well. And now looking back on that, I'm like, man, if I really would have had like just a little bit more perspective of having a little bit more success, maybe before that failure, I might not have taken that that hard, but that was my experience. And it feels wasted because I look at it through a lot of lenses of my life of things I didn't do because I was scared. I was more scared of failure than having fun. Sure. Or success yeah. or just the experience of failing. Like that's fine. Like that's still an experience. Uh, my, my best friend from high school who tragically is no longer with us was famous. I was going to say notorious, but he's not notorious. He was famous for just, he just didn't give a shit and not one of those ways. Like, Oh, that guy's an asshole. Like he doesn't care about what anybody thinks. He just, he was going to do what he wanted to do and he was going to have fun. And I'll never forget. We were at, um, I don't remember what function it was, but some like group or function or something that we were a part of did like a pool party and there was music playing and people were dancing and he went out and uh, we used to love that movie Grind. Have you ever seen that movie? I have not. Wait, skateboarding? Yeah. Wait, uh, rollerblading or skateboarding? Skateboarding. Okay. Um, but oh. there was there's a scene in that movie where they're in like a club and they do this. They break into this dance to uh, bust a move by is Young that MC. One, is that the one with Christian Slater? No. Okay. 
Oh, it's a, I'll have to look it up. It's a great movie. You're going to okay. have to check it out. So, so it, they, they break in the dance. But anyway, yeah. So there, there's a scene in a, a club where they break into this like choreographed dance. So Dylan used to love to do that. He'd, he'd do like one of the guy's dances from that movie. And he went to tag me in and we were at a pool party and there were girls there and I didn't want to embarrass myself. And I left Dylan hanging. And to this day, that is one of my great regrets in life because I was worried more about looking cool than like having fun and supporting my buddy. And I, I left him out there dancing and he, he tried to lasso me in and I didn't do it. So, you know, he, he, like I said, he's, he's no longer with us, but I've always tried to keep that in mind and tried to always like do him right by like, if there is a dance circle and I get pulled into it, I'm, I'm going. Well, and Okay, retrospectively looking at it, it's not even the girls thing. It's the like in that moment to have fun, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like in the moment you were probably worried about the girls, but retrospectively when you look at it, you go like, oh man, I should have just done that because it'd be fun to do things with my friend. Yeah. And I'm probably, even if I look silly, I still look cool because I'm doing things. You know what I mean? If you were to go back in time and like track down the people that were there, I'm one of maybe three people in the world that remembers that specific instance, you know, so it wouldn't are, matter. Are any of them girls or any of them the girls? Probably not. They probably <laughs> don't remember. So it, it doesn't matter, but I just, I remember, you know, I, I left my buddy hanging cause I was like, oh, I don't want to look like a dork, you know, I want to look cool. And uh, so, like I said, now if there's a dance circle or something like that and I get pulled in, I'm going to be in it. Yep. Fine. Fancy. Hmm. This last segment is brought to you by HeyJustBe.com. I believe that achieving balance in the mental, physical, and metaphysical aspects of your purpose by incorporating learning, serving, and creating can transform your life into one that you truly enjoy living. Want to know more? Go to www.HeyJustBe.com. All right, so like how I usually wrap this thing up, so I usually ask people like how they take care of themselves so they can take care of everybody else. So um, you obviously have been an athlete, so you've worked out a lot and it's probably hard. You're probably like, I'm overworking out because I worked out like all the time. So you have to find this like new motivation to work out to like stay in shape and stuff. Yes. Uh, no, I love working Are out. They, okay. I still go every day and I go by myself. A lot of people I know say like, well, I have to have like a gym buddy or do a class, but I work out. By myself. And what I time you it. go? Uh, it depends. Just you, you depends early, on. Are you an early morning guy? I now I am not a waking up at four a.m. to go hit the gym by five and be showered by six thirty. Lunchtime. I'm, I'm done with that. Oh, usually I go in the evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes, if schedule necessitates, I'll wake up at like six and maybe be in the gym by seven. But you make it a priority. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So For sure. So what what else do you do? Like what like what other things? Like are you a reader? Uh, I used to be. I don't read as much anymore. I uh, I take a lot of pride in my lawn. Okay. So the the lawn meditative. Would you say yeah. like get out there? And- yeah. Are you one of those guys? Like your shit looks like fucking the green and like the. It did earlier this year before this drought. Oh, kill it, huh? So I used to have a guy come and mow, and it was like 40 bucks per visit, and that was just starting to get pricey. So I bought a lawnmower, and that was my first job was mowing the grass at my parents' house. I'd get ten yard for the uh, $10 for the front yard, $10 for the backyard. I got $10 for the front yard, and I got... 15 for the backyard, but our backyard was huge. But did you have to sweep and edge and all that? No. Like, but they, the lawnmower they gave me, like the automatic, like drive was broken. And so it was basically like a push mower that was electric. You had an automatic drive? Well, no, <laughs> well, but, but it didn't work. I like, didn't even have one. No, wait, you had like a chopper? Like a, uh, like an old school chopper? No, I mean, it was a push mower. It just didn't have the... Yeah, ours was like broke or something okay. like that. Yeah, but like, yeah, we were 15. No, but I didn't have to do... My parents, they didn't trust me to edge. So I didn't have to edge. I had to sweep. Mm. And if sweeping wasn't done to like pretty exacting standards, like the way it would work, my dad would come out with the weed eater, he would edge, and then he was done. And <laughs> I had to like... He's cracking beers on the yeah, porch. Yeah, I had to mow and sweep... And he would come look. And if it wasn't done right, I wouldn't get paid. 
So he'd come check it out. And if I did a good job, he'd say, all right, here you go. That, that's, um, a, that's a pretty good thing to do for your kid. I think. Oh yeah. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Um, but anyway, I, <laughs> I went and bought a lawnmower and it's like riding a bike, you know, it comes right back to you. It's crisp lines, all that. My girlfriend was like, it's going to take you way too long. You're not going to want to spend your time doing that after working all day. Like, I don't know why you're getting this lawnmower. And the first time I did it, I had like, I had edged it up. I had mowed. I took the blower out there and got everything done. I trimmed the trees. I have a bunch of crepe myrtles at my yard. Did you you do lines like a baseball field? No, I I didn't go into that level. Just straight. And I made her come outside. (laughs) And I was like, look at, look at the yard. Look what I made. She walked out and she was like, holy shit. And I said, I know. Cause the, the dude that would mow, he had a big, like uh, ride on not a riding mower but like one of the ones you stand on so the mowing deck was like 40 inches wide like in front and then he stands on it behind it yeah okay um so you know he there'd be divots in the yard and stuff because mine slopes so mowing with a, a normal push mower it was able to be like a lot more detailed and she came out there and was just like shit okay i get it like that's fair so uh do you uh you do headphones when you Yes. Okay. Uh, what do you listen to when you mow? Uh, d- it depends. I'm either listening to uh, like some su- like new Southern rock. Uh huh. So like Whiskey uh, Myers. Whiskey Myers, The Weeks. Okay. Who I know Logan's probably told you about. Yeah. Um, Alabama Shakes. Yeah. Nathaniel Rateliff and the Night Sweats. Okay. Are a good one. Or I'm listening to like old school hip hop, like uh, Life We Live by Fat Pat. And uh, H Town rap, oh, yeah, oh, god bless. Like early, like late 90s, early 2000s, H Town rap, though. Like, I used to, I, I, I mean, I've told this before. Uh, Slim Thug used to work out at oh, my, yeah. my 24 hour fitness that I yeah. worked at or whatever, and he came in and signed a CD. But I think one of his friends did it, I don't think he did it, sure. but who cares? Anyways, yeah, Slim Thug would work out. So, Mike Jones, yeah, you know, Paul Wall, any, any swish of house. I'm listening to it, man. That's like, I can't believe we had we didn't talk about this on this whole podcast about H Town rap. Oh, it's so well, you have to come back and just talk about H Town rap. Man, that was so. That was one of those things. Like growing up, so I had a, a cousin who was like my he he was five years older than me, or no, he's four years older than me. My sister's three years older. He's one year older than her. Uh, but that was like my in to all that because he lived like in the next town over and was like a little more rough around the edges. So he showed me like all this rap and stuff when I was younger. So I'm sitting in school at Lily white, you know, Friendswood, uh, you know, schools with all my classmates. And I know about, you know, uh, Mike Jones and I know all the words just still tip in and all this other stuff. And people are like, what, what is that? That's weird. You know, cause they're listening to backstreet boys and NSYNC. It's such a, it's such a subculture and it's weird that Southern rap became a style of rap that's considered with other styles of rap yeah. because it, for the longest time, it was just like the subculture of what me and my friends listened to because we were so close to Houston and stuff yeah. like that. So it's just, it's just really, it's really weird. Like yeah. uh, DJ screw is like the weirdest thing to try to explain to people. You know what I mean? You're yeah. like, you like, what are you, you listening to DJ? Screw? Yeah. So what it, so like he just slows the records down. It's, it's records I've already listened to. It's other people, but he just does them slower. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? It's just the weirdest thing to try to explain. And then you wish people a happy June 27th. That's if right. they celebrate and God, they're God like, bless. why are you wishing me a happy June 27th? And you're like, never mind. You don't get it. Don't you, you worry don't, about you it. You don't know. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, do you, so is your, your lawn is your meditation? Uh, doing the lawn, working out. I do, uh, play a decent bit of halo still yeah i'm one of like six people still keeping it going have they not released a newer halo what's the last thing there's there's newer ones i i have the the master chief collection Uh so i'll get on there and just play some like social xbox live like i'm 12 so like uh they've already released a a bunch of other versions so you're kind of who's left from that older version well the master chief collection is everything up through halo four or five okay so you can kind of play them all so it'll, it'll play all of them so i'll go get on the sticks for a little while and just you know see if i still got it do, do you uh you do madden no which did, is did you did you do ncaa when it was out no 
Really? The last like sports video game that I've played any significant amount of time was uh, ESPN NFL 2K5. Oh, damn. With Terrell Owens on the cover. He's like reaching out for a, for a catch. Dang. I played the face off of a copy of that when I was like, it stopped working when I was younger. So, the, so, okay. Why do you think you don't play sports games? Cause I would have totally guessed you would play sports. Games. I don't know. I'm not good at them. You're not good at them. No. So I had friends growing up that would like, oh, let's play Madden or let's play like NBA 2K. And that was big on the team. Uh, guys would play 2K or they'd play Madden. And I just, I'm not good at it. Okay. But so like when you sit down and you watch Madden and they pull up, can you read the, can you can tell what defense they're in and stuff like that? Can you? Yeah. Because I, you have football knowledge. I definitely. So that's, it's like, you know, if you take Spanish in school and yeah. you don't practice it, you yeah. kind of lose it. So I can still look at some concepts and I know like, would what you just bat on the call. sticks with the stuff? Yeah. I don't know. I feel like it, it also used to piss me off because you look at some of the people that are really good at Madden and I'm like, if we were in pads, I could change <laughs> the trajectory of your fucking life and you're like talking trash because you beat me at this video game. <laughs> but like I could, I could go get my helmet from the other that's, room. That's fair. And get you a helmet and I could just CTE your ass right now. That, I mean, that's, that's fair. So I get so frustrated. That's fair. Um, but yeah, I never, never really got into the sports video games. I have Madden downloaded on my xbox i play it about four times a year and i go into just like exhibition mode i'm a cowboys fan so i'll i'll play with the cowboys and beat like you know the what like the i guess the commanders now yeah but i'll go on there and beat the commanders like 60 to nothing and then i'm good for another like six months I um I'm constantly trying to bring the Texans out of me out of mediocrity. <laughs> that's all. That's all I'm doing is like, like I remember when like the last year Deshaun Watson was on the Texans. Okay, I was like I might not ever play this video game another the new version ever again. Yeah, because like we're this is not going to be good forever. Like it felt like, and then they got Shroud, and we'll see how that kind of goes. You know what I mean? We'll see. Uh, his debut was interesting. I. It, it's kind of funny. I don't watch nearly as much NFL football as I used to. Um, growing up, me, the, I, I would watch Cowboys games with my dad. But then when I got to college on Sunday, we had practice all day. So and so I got out of the habit of watching uh, NFL games. And so now when I go back to watch it, it's just not the same. So I love if there's college football on. I'll catch, you know, some action on a Thursday night. Sure. Like I'll watch any college football game that's on. I'll watch Citadel play James Madison and just be really invested in the game for no reason. I'll just decide who I'm rooting for. And then I'm in front of the TV like it's the national championship. Just like if we don't stop them on third down, we're going <laughs> to fucking lose. And, you know, it's a team. You're that in. I, You're I, in. Yeah, I have no skin in the game whatsoever. Oh, man. Will, are you glad that you came back for a second time? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. This but, is awesome. Is it is it better with me being in a chair rather than Logan? It's so much better. <laughs> I actually don't really care to talk to Logan ever. This is why I don't. No, just kidding. Love you, Logan. Um, no, it it's funny, and I, I was kind of thinking about that when you invited me to be back on. If the you know the dynamics would be different because last time you were kind of off camera. Yeah. You know, it was me and Logan and and Eddie in the the space helmet did we end up leaving it that way no no uh he he actually gets out of the helmet and like you see him and yeah, stuff like that we, he gets beamed in well i mean i went to youtube university and i was like how do i blah, 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 and yeah. like learn and so like i was i was pretty proud of myself it it turned out looking good on the on the draft that episode uh will have already come out by the time you see this yeah you can go um, back and watch it yeah yeah um no but it, it was cool being on with those guys but it was it was also interesting. I was I was driving up here and I was like, well, what if he asks me this? And so I was talking to myself, you know, like, oh, well, I would probably say this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I feel like I never ask the questions that people think I'm going to ask, which is a good thing. Well, and then people are like, kind of like, hey, what are we going to talk about? I'm like, I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Like you, you start talking and then I'm going to have questions like, you know what I mean? Like and so I don't know what to tell people yeah. when they want pre questions. I was like, you answered the pre questions. That's the only questions I have. Yeah. Anyways. Well, man, you know this. I ask people to give me a hug. So if oh, you don't yeah. mind, jump up there. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Oh, man. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks for having me back yeah. on. Yeah. Absolutely.